Hello, everybody. I'm John Murphy. Welcome to Eastern Connecticut Arts Review, a weekly magazine about people, organizations, special events, and news for the arts community across Eastern Connecticut in Tolland, Wyndham, and New London counties. I'm here with you every Wednesday at 5.30 with my co-producer, Matt, Matt Rupar, and our program today will be in two segments. For the second half, we're going to have a special audio excerpt from a, uh, from a audio webinar yesterday about reopening arts venues safely in Connecticut. It has some very current information and protocols from the Yale School of Public Health. We're going to share some audio uh, for the second part of the program. But right now I'm very happy to have Richard White with me in the studio. He is one of the founders and he's currently president of the Coventry Arts Guild. He's been in the studio here many times over the years. It's great to have you back again. And Good to be here, John. Season's greetings. Please. Indeed. <laughs> Special time of the Tis year. the season. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the Arts Guild is quite busy now, so the first thing that we want to do while we have time is run down some of the events, and then you have some very interesting grant projects underway that's going to build your base for more events and more support, which is a great way to start the new year. It would be a great way, and we are very optimistic. But, uh, we have uh, <clears throat> we have a member show coming up at the Wyndham Arts, uh, <clears throat> the gallery at the Wyndham Memorial Hospital, um, mm -hmm. and that's January 3rd through the 9th. Uh, it's co-presentation with Wyndham Regional Arts Council. Um, we're going to do we're a whole ra raft of, uh, of workshops scheduled for uh, 2022, and that uh, includes January 29th, Long Stitch Book Binding with uh, Barbara Timberman, who is going to be presenting uh, a variety of uh, techniques to do uh, personal sketchbooks, and they're beautiful books. Uh, they're very, very popular workshops. Uh, we also have been maintaining for the last uh, six months after a quiet COVID time, we have a, a lobby exhibition at the Coventry branch of the Key Bank. Uh, Dee Volkert is finishing up December. I'll be showing some uh, photographs um, in January, and Kathy Shires will be showing her work in February. So we're launching some programming. We've been nice. quiet and cautious up until now, and we will continue to be cautious, but I hope less quiet. <laughs> a joyous kind of sound. There we'll you go. I'll make some joy. <laughs> there you go. We'll have to do a shout out to Kathy Shires from the Wyndham Regional Arts Council for RAC. Season's greetings to the gang. All righty. There you go. So we have a um, full planning plan agenda for 2022. We have applied for a couple of grants to help uh, build our organization infrastructure, and it sounds like we're going to get one of them for sure. Um, we heard some good news this morning, and the other one is in the works to do uh, to fund some programming. So uh, we're learning how to be a, a grown-up uh, arts organization and getting our cutting our teeth on grant funding and uh, good good sound business practices so that we can be continue to be a player in the grant seeking grant funding world so we're uh, we're excited we well, you know that's happening across the state right now as local organizations are finally getting investments so they could build their business model to kind of go beyond just the survival mode exactly. to become more productive with either fundraising, as you said, or member development, or just better promotion so people know what Indeed. the heck you're doing all the time, Indeed. right? That's a challenge, just to yeah. let people know. Sure is. This is kind of the, the silver lining of the COVID cloud. There's a lot of money out there, and they, they've made it available um, in, with fairly simplified grant uh, application processes so that we can become players in that in that world and we're, we're very excited to to do that and grow our programming and our membership yeah that's that's the big the big news we have a lot of plans and we're going to watch the covid situation and be cautious um, but we hope we can uh, make uh, make some some good inroads and uh, we had a very successful Although minimized year uh, in, in uh, 2021, we got got active. Uh, we built a, a new sculpture, a monumental sculpture in the village, a David Hayes sculpture, with a fifth of uh, of five that uh, we've put up over the years. Is that right off 31? It's right across from the clock on Main Street. Uh, oh, nice. And it's up on a bluff. It's a, beautiful 10-foot tall sculpture called Rooster. Um, we did a great reception in September where uh, we uh, hosted uh, Connecticut Main Streets. They came in and had a wonderful outing at our uh, Millbrook Place uh, location. And uh, so we're uh, 
we're cautious, but we're uh, we're getting things going. We've had some planning meetings, and we're looking at a host of workshops uh, going forward, uh, drawing uh, things like uh, learning how to make photographs with your iPhone camera. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a fellow who's uh, who's quite expert at that, and he's going to do some some teaching. So uh, we have a we're trying to do a, a workshop a month. So we uh, we have this uh, long stitch book binding going in January, and that will be a big uh, a big launch. So. Uh, Wish us well on that. It's a lot of good energy for the new year, Richard. I'm we hope to we tell can you. keep it up. Our, our our group is very excited to to see these uh, opportunities coming coming, and uh, we're going to keep them fired up. <laughs> keep the, keep the fire lit underneath them. <laughs> So what I want to do to close with Richard is give you two ways to stay in touch with these good folks throughout the year. One is they have a very nice Facebook page that's pretty active, Coventry Arts Guild. And the website is equally confusing, CoventryArtGuild.org. Coventry Arts Guild, I should say, CoventryArtsGuild.org, and you can track all these events. And also, the board is always looking for new volunteer members. If you want to get involved, there's many ways to connect, many skills you, that you can contribute. So whatever you bring will be deeply appreciated. So, Richard, thanks for being here, man, and I wish you all a very good year ahead. Well, thank you so much for having us. It's always okay. a pleasure to come back. Okay. Okay, our time is tight. We're going to go right now to this audio from yesterday's webinar. This is from the Shoreline Arts Alliance. They've been doing a series of webinars for two years now, looking at COVID, how to cope with it, and how to plan ahead for the future in a safe way that grows the economy but also keeps us safe. And this is some information I'm going to share from the, uh, from the, from the meeting yesterday. This is from... Uh, Sten Vedmond, he is Dr. Uh, Vedmond, he's the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health, and he's focusing really on arts venues reopening and how to do it safely. So the um, Kaiser Family Foundation has a very educational series of surveys that they do every six weeks or so. And they ask a question like, if coronavirus vaccines are determined to be safe by scientists and is available for free to everyone who wanted it, would you definitely get it or probably get it? Or would you definitely not get it or def probably not get it or definitely not get it? And here's good news that a heck of a lot of people have gotten vaccinated in this survey. And that's been a gradual success story. Like I said, we're lagging with boosters, but, but basic vaccination, we've done well. So these people have already gotten it. But take a look at the definitely not group or the only if required group. It's kind of hovering in this 20% range all the way back since December 19, uh, uh, 2020. So since December 2020, we've had this hardcore pool of anti-COVID vaccination folks who are doing everything they can to avoid getting vaccinated. And that is a problem for our nation. It's even worse when you ask parents about their teenagers or their kids, where it's an even higher number in the in the sort of 30 to 40 range uh, of parents who are saying that they definitely won't or only if absolutely mandated, which is kind of turning things on its head. Usually parents care more about the health of their children than they do about their own health. So they're more likely to get their kids vaccinated and cared for at the doctor than they are to get themselves vaccinated or cared for at the doctor. But somehow the narrative has become so toxic that parents are, are scared on behalf of their kids. So they say, I'll take the risk for myself, this horrible risk of this vaccine, oh my God, but I'm not gonna have, uh, ex expose my child to this terrible thing. What, what the, the, the toxic narrative is that this is a terrible thing. This is the, one of the safest vaccines ever developed in the history of humankind. It's one of the most effective and it's a lifesaver. That's the true narrative, but people don't get it. Now it's become partisan. Now I will say public health has always been political. If I want a new sewage treatment plan in my community, and I go to the alder, alder persons of the town or the, or the city council and I say, we need another, you know, we need a bond for $40 million sewage treatment plan because the one that we have isn't working properly and can't be remediated, we need a new one. Well, some people will vote for that and some people will vote against it. But for public health measures, we've always had a mix of Republicans and Democrats on both sides, you know? 
it isn't necessarily, it's political, but it's not partisan. Somehow this thing has become partisan. And take a look at the Democrats who are anti-COVID vaccine compared to the Republicans who are anti-COVID vaccine. Take a look at the older folks, the college graduates, the people with underlying health conditions, urban residents, compared to rural residents, younger people, um, people without a college degree. So there has become this, this, this dichotomy in advocacy where we've ended up with this red blue kind of difference, which I get it if you're talking about Build Back America plan and you don't wanna spend the money, but I don't get it when we're talking about protecting families, protecting vulnerable people, returning our economy to normal. How, how we ended up with this partisan debate, I don't know. However, there are positives. Take a look at this. A majority, a clear majority of Republicans have gotten vaccinated. So it's not some kind of monolithic viewpoint. It's not like va Republicans are against vaccine. A majority of them are in favor. Just like a majority of Republicans believe that climate change is real. So it's just the very loud voices of this minority that get amplified by sympathetic politicians and media uh, sources that, that distort the arguments. Now, um, take a look at th these data from friends of mine at the University of, of, of um, Michigan. They, they find that individuals who resent authority are twice as likely to never wear a mask. And individuals who believe the truth about coronavirus is being kept from the public are twice as likely to never wear a mask. So how to communicate with folks like this the, the NIH has written material, the CDC has written material. If you wanna um, take a quick screenshot with your camera and, and, and look this up, feel free, but you can just do uh, you know, COVID vaccination communication and then CDC or NIH and you can get it pretty fast. Now, what I'm doing with folks who don't wanna be vaccinated I'm trying to validate and respect their concerns. This is an old trick that clinicians have. Uh, I've been trying to convince parents as a pediatrician to vaccinate their kids for decades. And you, you affirm and agree as far as you can to validate and respect their concerns. You're right that the pharmaceutical industries make a lot of money. You're right that the vaccine was developed in record time. You're right the government has historically treated one group or another group or another group, depending upon what the concern of the parent meant, the African Americans, Native Americans, whatever, badly. You've thought about this a lot. You value your freedom. There's no harm in validating that. And I'm giving you some holiday advice here at the dinner table. And, but, but you may wanna trans, transition them to protecting themselves, helping others, protecting the, the family or the clan. So if they don't want to get a vaccine, see if you can coax them to consider the benefits for their family. Maybe they'll get it for the sake of their loved ones or their community. And, you know, some people may be influenced by celebrity spokespersons. I'm impressed by Dolly Parton and Morgan Freeman. You can look them up on YouTube. Absolutely remarkable public service announcements. Uh, with Morgan Freeman, he speaks for about a minute and a half. And Dolly Parton shows your, herself getting her own vaccine, and then she sings a song. So <laughs> amazing stuff. And counter-arguing is often counterproductive. You need to take a low-key stance. They, people have heard that these are safe, effective vaccines over and over and over, and they just don't believe it. So it may be more than information that's going to convert people's views. Now, let's end on statements for the arts, uh, vaccine mandates. If you want to um, open your arts venues or your museums for vaccinated persons, you can do what Broadway is doing, which is you have to show your vaccine card. You could uh, try to keep things more democratic, small d, by also offering non-vaccinated people the option to show that they have tested negative within the last two days. And I certainly think you should consider universal vaccines for staff, docents, volunteers, and performers. Because I do not want to go to your theater if you can't tell me that you haven't gone to the trouble of having your performers and, and staff members vaccinated to protect me. It's like a healthcare worker. I don't want to go to your hospital 
if you if your healthcare workers are not vaccinated and are going to be, risk infecting me. Uh, and I feel like like the arts are a little bit like the health, the healthcare industry. You don't want to infect your patrons. And physical spacing is a good idea when you can manage it. Surface cleansing, concessions, keeping those the way you did before. Online ticket sales are good. Pre-ordered concessions are, are a trick that many of you are using. Outdoor activities, uh, optimizing indoor air quality, um, communication of safety measures to the audience. Tell them what you're doing. Announcements from the stage, on your website, notes in the program, having respected community spokespersons make some statement. So, you know, try to rebuild confidence in our patrons. And we're doing a lot with the Governor's Task Force, Facebook, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, Medicine, the World Health Organization. We've worked with the Creative Coalition, uh, the University of Southern California, uh, Rotary International, most importantly, the Shoreline Arts Alliance. And with the Global Health Leadership Initiative, we've been working with all these groups on all these issues uh, for the last uh, almost two years now. So I wanted to uh, conclude by saying vaccinate, 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 test, test, test. These are powerful tools to get us out of this pandemic. We need to rebuild consumer confidence by protecting our performers, staff, and patrons. Okay, I've been sharing some audio from you from a webinar yesterday brought to us from the Shoreline Arts Alliance. You've been listening to Dr. Sten Vermin. He's the dean of the Yale School of Public Health. He's a regular partner in this series of webinars that's been going on now for about a year and a half, almost two years, with Eric Dillner from the Shoreline Arts Alliance. Uh, Alliance. If you want some more information about the series, to find out about more broadcasts and more information about COVID safety, just go to shorelinearts.org. And now two quick announcements coming up right now. There is a special art show going on at the Eastbrook Mall in the Coffee Break Gallery. It's going until December 30th, and it's featuring the members and friends of the Ashford Arts Council. So it if you're in the area, stop by, see what you can do to support the local arts. One last quickie on, J on January 1st, besides the New Year's Day, David Foster and the Shabu All-Stars are doing two sets at St. Paul's at 3 and 6 p.m. Saturday, January 1st. You can get tickets at Eventbrite. Everything, of course, goes to the Covenant Soup Kitchen. Have a great holiday. We certainly will see you next Wednesday. And until then, take care and be well.